Dr. Adams, is the treatment by simply taking blood from these people on a regular basis, is that the only treatment at this point? Well, it's a rather medieval-sounding treatment, but it actually works remarkably well. And this treatment is very similar to voluntary blood donation uh, for the patient. They come in usually to a hospital, outpatient setting, and a small needle is placed in the vein, usually in the elbow area, and uh, about a pint of blood is taken off. And uh, this takes maybe 30 minutes, and it's usually done weekly. And the idea is that when you have blood taken off, your body has to make new blood. To make new blood, it needs iron. senses there's a lot of iron around and sucks the iron out of the tissues like the liver to make the new blood. So uh, the duration of treatment depends on how much iron you're starting with. And uh, probably the longest we've ever treated somebody is four years every week. But as we're diagnosing this earlier, there are people who can be treated within a few months. Now, are there alternatives? Well, there have been some uh, medications on the market, some pills that decrease iron levels. Um, they don't have that appealing uh, profile compared to phlebotomy. But don't most medications have side effects, don't they? Well, that's so. right. And yeah. the, 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 these iron chelator pills, uh, some of them are $75 per day and have side effects and may have to be taken indefinitely. So those are really not the recommended treatment for hemochromatosis. There are some other causes of iron overload, which are blood diseases, like thalassemia, for example, or sickle cell disease. And in those kind of diseases, you can't take blood off because they're starting with a low tank. So in those diseases, they sometimes use some of these medications. But sickle cell is usually in the black population, is it not? Or yeah, am I wrong? yeah, yeah, that's yeah. a different disease, yeah. but you can get iron overload with that. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the other things that, uh, Brian, well, we have uh, Dr. Adams on the line. Uh, Dr. Adams has uh, clearly talked about the liver, and the liver is the first receptor for iron as it filters the blood. But this iron can get into the pancreas and can cause diabetes. It can get into the heart and cause arrhythmias of uh, an irregular heartbeat in the heart. And and um, also uh, a loss of muscle um, uh, um, control in the in the heart. So this is called a myopathy, and uh, it can get into the pituitary gland and cause Alzheimer's d uh, disorder, into the joint tissues and cause severe and painful arthritis. We're talking about a total body experience. Wherever the the iron, the body looks for places to put this iron, and it keeps just putting it there and getting it out of the bloodstream because it's too heavy to stay in the bloodstream. So then, Dr. Adams, as, as Bob pointed out, it can affect the heart, the pancreas, and other organs in the body, other bodies. Body symptoms. Uh, we talked about the liver at some length, but is it possible that the liver involvement could be overlooked and it could actually be diagnosed after it's moved on to the heart? Or the oh, pancreas? yes. Yes. Uh, there are people that present with the arthritis. That's uh, actually one of the more common presentations in younger women. And in that situation, it's often the knuckles in the hands uh, of the index finger and the long finger. That's sometimes a typical area for arthritis to start. Uh, diabetes is also sometimes a presenting complaint. Um, shortness of breath can be a complaint associated with iron in the heart. An abnormal heart rhythm can lead to fainting or palpitations. Now, let's talk a little bit about dietary and lifestyle concerns here because... Um, I take it, if does lifestyle exacerbate and speed up the progression of this disease? For example, if you're dealing with people who have a high iron diet, they love their red meat, they love their high iron vegetables, they may be taking dietary supplements thinking they're doing something good for their health. Does this exacerbate and speed up the whole process? Well, I mean, you have to be taking iron in to absorb it, but all food pretty much has iron in it. You may know that Food uh, has been supplemented with iron in North America since the 1950s. You see this on cereal boxes and milk and so on. Interestingly enough, in Sweden, they decided that there are more people with iron overload than iron deficiency. So they removed that supplementation 
from and the as you food point out, the symptoms can be similar. I mean, if you have fatigue, and you, yep. you know, my goodness. But, you know, the diet story, I, I think, may have been overemphasized on the Internet and so on. We've studied this in quite a bit of detail in some of our research studies with 40-page dietary questionnaires comparing people with a lot of iron and not much iron. And it's been pretty hard to show that uh, that has a big impact. So we don't recommend patients be on any special diet. We, we, we don't advocate they take iron supplements. Uh, high doses of vitamin C have been said to be uh, potentially hazardous in this situation. There's been some talk about raw shellfish uh, being hazardous. I mean, these aren't healthy foods for, for any people to be eating. Uh, you know, alcohol, excess alcohol can make this worse. But again, this applies to the general public. But if well. you have the liver ailment, and of course, alcohol is going to inflame the liver. So I guess that, that makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah. Let's take a break. We'll come back with our guests. Listen, the you folks out there, if you have any questions for our guests or concerns, if in fact you have any anything anecdotally to tell us, perhaps you're, you have experience with this. You may have hemochromatosis. You may have a family member or a friend. Uh, whatever the case, we'd like to hear from you as well this morning. We'll be back with our guests and your phone calls after this. 